Good evening, everybody. Well, it's evening in London. I can see there are still some people registering. So I will give it a couple of moments before we start. Right, I hope you're all sitting comfortably with your favorite beverage close by. I think we are okay to start. This is where I would normally welcome you all to Savoy Place, but the pandemic made sure we've been kept away for six months and with little prospect of getting back anytime soon. So we have to adapt. On the plus side, we had close to 600 registrations for this event. There's no way we could fit you all in the Kelvin Lecture Theatre as it is limited to 475 capacity. I also don't need to bother with fire safety briefing or ask you to keep your phone switched off, but needless to say, stay vigilant and enjoy the presentation. This is our first webinar for the Central London Network, so I do hope the technology and the internet doesn't let us down, but just in case we encounter any problems, please be a bit patient with us and we'll try to resolve issues quickly. A uh, few words about the organizers first. The event is tonight organized by the IT Central London Local Network as part of a series of evening lectures that have been running for the last 16 years at Savoy Place. For those that haven't visited yet, it is a splendid building in central London with an excellent view of the River Thames. You should come visit sometime. The network is entirely run by a committee of IT volunteers and funded by the IT. I'd normally ask committee members to stand up and show themselves so that you can identify them during the networking drink session, but unfortunately, there'll be none of that tonight. I suspect we have quite a few people here who are not Subway Place regulars. So I should introduce myself first. My name is Xenophon Christodelu, and I'm the current chairman of the IET London Network. I'm often asked by people attending our events how to get involved with volunteer work of the network. We have five geographical networks within London run by different committees and a young professional committee. Each have their own budget and activity plans. If anyone is interested, just email me with your contact details. You've got my email on the, uh, on the screen, your locality and a short note of your professional background and specific interests, and we'll pass it on to the relevant section. I also receive proposal for future event on interesting topics and notable speakers. Again, please send me any suggestions you may have to the email below and I'll make sure it is forwarded to our committees. The presentation tonight should last under an hour. We have allowed time to address questions at the end. There's quite a few people on, so we'll try and take as many questions as we can, but we are limited to about half an hour question time. As you appreciate, it's an interactive session online. So many people, it's impossible to manage, or nearly impossible to manage, uh, taking on live questions. So we prefer your questions in writing. There's no point in raising hands. I'd like to ask you all to use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screens, or I think it's at the bottom of your screens, to actually write your questions. Please do not use the chat button for questions because it's not being monitored. Uh, we'll either respond to the question in writing directly or we'll leave it to the end for the speaker to respond to. So I said it's nearly impossible as we're planning to use the polling function on Zoom to keep you all or most of you awake. 
Questions will pop up on your screen for you to respond to by selecting the answer that mostly represents your situation or view. The results will be available to you all as soon as the poll is closed. We'll leave enough time for you to respond to. So we're now going to have a first practice on the polls. It is of interest to us to know how many of our regulars have managed to join us and how many new people we have managed to attract by moving the event online. You should now be able to see the questions. So if you are a member of the IT, we're interested to know if you previously attended our events at Subway Place or not. And the same goes for the non-members, wherever you may be. So I'll give you some time to respond to that. That's interesting. The majority members of the IT that haven't been to any of our events before, and we've got 35 of our regulars, about 20%. And quite a few non-members that have attended before. Excellent. Um, so it's also interesting to know how far we've managed to reach for a new audience before the boundaries of London and how effective our publicity campaign for the event has been. All important stuff for us as we are preparing for purely online events for at least the next six months. I know Greenland and Antarctica are a slim chance, but who knows? We live in strange times. So uh, if you attempt this one as well, C7 from Asia, one from the Americas, one from Africa, one other, I've missed something out, and nobody from Greenland and Antarctica. Many thanks for your response. Uh, tonight, We have with us Michalis Michael, the founder and CEO of Digital Emar, who is going to talk to us about his knowledge on artificial intelligence and abstraction data and how that is changing the fundamentals of business decision making. Michalis is an aerospace engineer by education and enhanced his interest in business management through attendance at both Harvard and London's. London Business Schools and a significant career. He has traveled extensively for his work and held positions in Germany, Poland, US, and the UK now since 2010. He speaks four languages and his company, Digital Emar, is a technology company in artificial intelligence uh, powered data analytics. So, Michalis, without any further ado, I hand over to you. Thank you very much, Sen. Let me just stop this results. Can you hear me okay? Uh, okay. All right. Um, okay, so it is indeed a great pleasure to be uh, talking, hopefully with you guys and not just to you. Uh, it's good to have uh, fellow engineers uh, as an audience for once. Um, so the original title for this presentation uh, was AI and structured data are changing the fundamentals of business decision making. I thought about it a bit more since we, we came up with the presentation title. Now I think it is more appropriate to replace business decisions with a slightly more encompassing term, human life. So let's see uh, if that uh, is uh, indeed the case. Uh, not sure if you're here because the title is a bold statement 
or because you totally buy it and you want to learn more. I'm, I'm curious uh, to find out during the q and A, I I suppose. In, in this presentation, uh, hopefully you will find take home value that you can apply immediately to your business. But on the other hand, uh, I also hope to make you think about a little more about life, human longevity, the universe and the future of our species. So let me start with a somewhat odd narrative for a presentation with a title like this, uh, but hopefully it will make uh, sense in the end. When I found out about Spotify, I sold my CDs. And when I found out about Netflix, I sold all my DVDs. When I found out about Uber, I sold my car. And when I found out about Airbnb, you guessed it, I sold my house. Well, this is not me. Uh, it's uh, the, the guy who said it uh, was at a conference I attended in, in Atlanta in the US and he also said that he was, he considered himself a digital nomad. Um, he said that he only owns 300 items out of which 150 are his favorite books with signatures from the authors. And, uh, and the rest is clothing and, uh, and personal care items. The shared economy driven ownership drop will impact every sector. Uh, banking, real estate, transport, entertainment, manufacturing, you, you name it. My point is things change. Change is inevitable. It has always been this way, which I don't have to explain to you. The only difference now is that the acceleration of change is unprecedented. The pace of change will never be this slow again. To bring this point home, let me share some facts with you. This is the number of years it took for the following products or services to reach 50 million users. You might, you might have seen this before. It took 68 years for air travel to reach 50 million users. 62 years for cars. For TVs, it took 22 years. For computers, 14. You see the trend? For internet access, it took seven years to reach 50 million. For Facebook, it took three years. For Pokemon or Pornhub, guess what? It took 19 days to reach 50 million users. More data was created in the last two years than in the previous 5,000 years of humanity documenting knowledge. Social media and AI already have a bigger impact to the world than the industrial revolution of the 19th century, which brings us to this realization. People have needs and wants, and they increasingly express them online. Successful organizations connect known and unknown needs to solutions. There is a small problem though. These wants are in millions of posts in multiple languages. Not only this is big data, which brings its own challenges, but it is also unstructured. Did you know that approximately 90% uh, of the human knowledge ever recorded is unstructured data? And by that we mean text, uh, images, video, audio. Maybe only 10% of data available to us is numbers in tables, which I would call structured data. So that's an important point to remember during this whole presentation. 90% of all the data out there is unstructured. So now for the first time in the history of mankind, 
with the help of machine learning, which is a form of AI, we can analyze text in any language and images and process it to produce aggregated reports. We are now omniscient. We have superpowers. 100 years ago, if someone said they could know everything there is, uh, you know, all the knowledge in the world, or they could access it, they would be called gods or wizards or witches. Harari, uh, the author of uh, Homo Sapiens and Homo Deus, two excellent books which I recommend, uh, predicts um, a new religion that will replace Christianity, Judaism, Islam, Buddhism. Uh, he calls it Dataism. This is the second point on the agenda for today. We already covered change. We will cover Dadaism next. Um, 60 minutes is a pretty long time for a presentation, given that the average attention span for a lecture is 12 to 15 minutes. So we will add some more interactivity, uh, some more poll questions for you during this presentation. Um, and here is already your first take home tip. If you use Zoom and you did not know that it has a poll function, now you know and you can use it in the, in the future. Those questions will not only serve the purpose of keeping you engaged, but they will provide insight to you, to the organizers and, and myself on who you are, what's on your mind and what matters to you. So let's start uh, with the first one as, a, as another sort of practice. Um, so here is a question about COVID-19. What do you think caused COVID-19? I'll leave it up for, for a few seconds infected animals sold at the Wuhan market? Is it the virus escaped from a Chinese lab? Something to do with 5G? The virus was engineered and released by a US lab to blame the Chinese or something else? Right, so that's what you guys think. So that not, not, not too many uh, conspiracy theorists among, uh, among uh, our audience. Uh, most people believe uh, that it came out of the Wuhan uh, market. Thank you for that. Um, so, um, so that was uh, the, the third poll. Now, Dataism. This uh, new religion, according to Harari, <clears throat> assumes that life will be reduced to data flows. Can it though? Is, is, that, is that a possibility? And, and, and we're talking about moving from listening to our feelings to listening to the algorithms. Feelings are actually algorithms, if you think about it, but they're not the best in the world anymore. They used to be. But now Google and Facebook have better algorithms for feelings. Um, and if you're open to give them your data, like your DNA sequence, which is possible, your biometrics from a wearable, access to your emails and your clicks, they can tell you more, more about how you are than you can about yourself. With the rise of AI, more and more algorithms will evolve sort of independently. We'll talk more about that uh, later on. And it, and it will be um, increasingly difficult for humans to comprehend those algorithms. Um, machines, however, are perfectly capable to do so. This is a slightly revised wisdom pyramid. Um, so I added the word big next to data 
So big data at the bottom instead of just data. And I have split wisdom into insight for the presence and foresight for the future. Um, it is by now clear to all of us that humans can no longer cope with the deluge of data. Hence, we cannot distill data into information, let alone into knowledge or wisdom. And so Dadaists prefer to put their trust in big data and computer algorithms. Now, how important is data for you uh, and, and your businesses? The McKinsey Global Institute indicates that data-driven organizations are 23 times more likely to acquire customers, six times as likely to retain those customers, and 19 times as likely to be profitable as a result. This statement alone gives justice to the title of the presentation, and I'm going to repeat it, AI and unstructured data are changing the fundamentals of business decision making. They are because very few organizations uh, know what to do with the unstructured data at this point, and these are usually high-tech companies. So if you are an engineer in transport, let's say, how can unstructured data help you? Which brings us to social intelligence, which is one way to apply um, AI in order to understand unstructured data, which is, I repeat, text, audio, video, images. Social intelligence is now an integral part of business intelligence. If this is not the case yet within your organization, then one of your take home values from this presentation is to go back and start a process that will incorporate social intelligence as part of your own deluge of data. You may have heard of this discipline referred to as social media monitoring or social listening or web listening, but just harvesting posts from these sources like Twitter, YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, blogs, forums, reviews like TripAdvisor or Amazon is not really enough, right? Hopefully as part of your business intelligence process, you already analyze data from customer surveys, call centers, and actual customer behavior like uh, purchases of your products. Actionable insights is what everyone is after. And AI can help with that. The ability to take terabytes of text for the first time uh, in the history of humanity, I repeat, this only started in the last decade. Numbers and images, take those terabytes of text, numbers and images and turn them into something actionable, into structured data that you can understand and, and integrate with your other sources. That is a real paradigm shift. Now, how can AI turn posts or any structured data uh, into insights? The answer to this question is by simply annotating in an automated way the posts accurately for topics of conversation, sentiment, is it positive, negative, or neutral, or emotions, is it love, is it joy, is it hate, is it, what is it, and other useful metrics such as maybe purchase intent or recommendation uh, or, or other, other useful things. So, um, if you're still wondering how you can use these insights, after the next poll, which is coming up, uh, I will show you some examples uh, of, how, of how this is done. So here comes the next poll. Poll number four. There we go. Does the organization you are with currently use social media monitoring and analytics. Yeah. 
easy one to answer, I hope. All right, here are the results. Uh, it's about one third each, interesting. So uh, those of you who use it, congratulations, well done. Those of you who don't use it, please consider it because uh, that will make a big difference in the way you see the world, your business, your competition. And those who don't know, obviously ask somebody, find out when, when, when you're back. Thank you for that. Uh, and moving on to the examples of uh, what you can hope to get from social intelligence. So this is an example from um, um, public transportation. Uh, you can think of it as a, as a metro or, or as, a, as, a, as a tram. It's from uh, a period of 12 months. The, the, harp, the post in a language different other than English uh, and a country other than the UK. Um, it is, um, so the most important topic uh, of online posts is services, the blue line at the top, um, followed by uh, staff availability, the purple line just under, and then the third, most uh, popular topic is waiting time. Uh, on December 16, you will see that there's an interesting peak of the waiting time posts that uh, makes it the biggest topic. So above services and, uh, and staff availability. So uh, one could drill down into that peak and understand what is it that made people post so many more posts than usual about this uh, subject. The next example is uh, shows sentiment for each station uh, by specific topic. Uh, so so we're, we're still in, in the same product category, uh, public transportation, same country, same language, same everything. So if we are the station manager of station one, and we want to compare our social media performance to other stations like stations two, three, and four, we can look at the visual like this. So take services, for example, there were uh, 1,808 posts. For station one, 44% were positive out of all the posts about station one, 25% were negative, and 35% were neutral. And the color, the color scheme over here means that if it's green, we're comparing the share of positive of station one with the share of positive for stations two, three, and four. If it's green, it means station one is better. So 33% versus 8% on cleanliness, station one is better than station two, but it is worse than station three, which has 50% share of positive on cleanliness and is better than station four. Station three seems to be better than station one in all aspects. As you can see, everything is red. Uh, if I was the manager of station one, I would probably give a call to my colleague uh, at station three to find out what is it that he or she does better than us. In this uh, sector, we can also compare chatter about the lines. Um, the net sentiment score is a very neat composite metric that we uh, produced and trademarked. It mirrors the net promoter score, if you're familiar with it from the survey world. And it basically means it takes all the positive posts about say the blue line, minus all the negative posts divided by the sum. And uh, this metric can uh, take the value of minus 100% if, if all the posts are negative about a brand or a line in this case, or plus 100% if, if all the posts are positive. You see that uh, the net sentiment score is more or less similar. Blue line is slightly better at 45%, um, but not so many posts. So on the X axis, you have the volumes. So it's almost, nobody's talking about the blue line, but most people talk about the red line. 
So if the red line managed to get their uh, sentiment a bit higher, um, that would be good for them. Uh, and then this one is an example where we look at uh, uh, four KPIs. Uh, we're benchmarking stations based on services, waiting time, station facilities, and ease of access. And we did uh, station one is, for example, better than everyone else in waiting time and station facilities. Now, an example from another sector, banking, just to show you that I find this example quite impressive, to be honest, because it is solid proof that social media can impact the real world. In this example, what you see the bl is the, the blue line is the stock price of Deutsche Bank over a period of 12 months. The red line is the number of negative posts about Deutsche Bank on a subject which is very popular these days called ESG, which stands for environmental, social, governance. So what is amazing here is that you, you see the negative chatter, the negative sentiment on Deutsche Bank goes up, the, the stock price goes down. Uh, negative sentiment goes down, stock price goes up. And then again, a, a major uh, peak on negative sentiment on ESG, stock price goes down. The next one, I think it's even more impressive because it's 92% correlation. This is the same two lines for Barclays now, the British bank, where we are comparing their stock price every day, the blue line, to their positive and neutral posts about ESG. 92% correlation, quite high. All right, so now, how can social intelligence help your business or any business for that matter? It, it helps you understand customer needs and wants because they post about them. You can understand purchase occasions and usage occasions and also the needs and the motivations that drive those purchases. You can measure customer experience and identify operational improvement areas evaluate the effectiveness of your digital campaigns, track marketing performance in comparison to your competitors, identify triggers and barriers in your category, discover sales leads based on expressed purchase intent. That's a wonderful use case, a new source of sales leads. And finally, identify influencers not the celebrities, they're easy to find, but we're talking about micro influencers and, and nano influencers that can become your ambassadors. Now let's take a step back to better understand AI. Today's AI can be easily described with the formula shown on this slide. We also call this capability narrow AI. It means that the AI can do a single task really well, and we usually use supervised machine learning to do that. And that's what this formula describes. AI equals ML for machine learning algorithm. There is plenty of them which are open source, actually plenty of families of algorithms that you can access. They are called random forest or support vector machines, SVMs, or neural networks. So that's machine learning algorithms, one of them, plus training data, which is usually produced by humans. Uh, and it's kind of expensive to do that. Humans that are native language speakers, if we're talking about text, plus human in the loop. And that's usually the data scientist uh, who puts together the training data with the machine learning algorithm and creates a custom model that does a single task very well. Now, um, more and more, we also use unsupervised machine learning for narrow AI and deep learning, uh, trying to produce better results than uh, using uh, the supervised machine learning. Which brings us to the next uh, poll, number five, which is about this subject. 
do you currently use AI at your work to work? Yes or no, don't know. Right. So it looks like most of you don't. So there's an opportunity there for you. And it's getting easier by the day to get involved. And uh, uh, there, there's so many uh, possibilities to do that. Um, and uh, again, those who don't know, the obvious action and take home thing is to go ask uh, at your organization if, if this is done. Um, or, or, or if this is uh, not done. Okay, so that's these are the results uh, for this. Let's uh, move on to uh, the next slide. Um, now, from narrow AI, which is what we have today, we hope to transition during this decade, or I, I hope, to general AI, which is another way to say human uh, uh, intelligence, the AI to, be, to reach human intelligence. Well, optimists say that this might happen in the next 10 to 20 years. Pessimists say not before the end of this century. Um, and um, the super pessimists, they say never. Um, one algorithm that can uh, multitask, uh, that, that already exists. Um, okay, stop sharing results. I don't know if one of my co-panelists is, is doing something with these polls, but please don't. Um, so um, it is possible to have uh, an algorithm, to train an algorithm to do more than one things. Like in, in our case, we can train, we, we're now experimenting with training an algorithm to annotate for sentiment, topics, emotions, and relevance. Um, and that is an interesting uh, way to go forward with the hope to reach uh, human level AI. Now, Google's uh, deep mind um, and I know you had an event with Demis Hasabis uh, on that, defines their goal as solving intelligence, which translates to giving a machine a goal, enabling it to make uh, observations of an environment via multiple channels, usually it's vision, and then take action to fulfill the goal. Now, what should we expect by 2100 though? The big and for some scary question is when will the singularity mo moment happen if ever? Now what is the singularity moment? This is the moment a few seconds after human intelligence will be reached by the machines. That's when the so-called intelligence explosion will take place. Namely, the machine will improve itself by writing its own code and upgrading its intelligence by orders of magnitude in seconds or minutes, unless if there are hardware limitations. So if the hardware can handle the super intelligence, then the software will be produced in seconds or minutes. But if the hardware is not up to scratch, then it will take a bit longer for the AI to produce the new computers in order to run its new software, its new brain. Um, in all honesty, we, we don't know what the future will bring. Nobody does for sure. There are ethical and legal considerations about the future of AI. We all know that we want to avoid a Terminator or a Star Wars scenario. Uh, 
and there is something we can do actually we can all think about it and i will share some questions later on uh, for you to go online and answer if you if you want then there is the the longevity race uh, stay alive until 2050 and chances are you will become immortal not immortal because you can still die if you're hit by a bus but immortal in your word possible scenario is m which is the book i'm sharing here by robin hanson m stands for brain emulation uh, and i guess the question is how do you feel about uploading your brain to a computer that might be a path to true immortality since you can have a backup and if your if your current android is hit by a bus you can occupy another android here's an interesting question for you if the future matters more than the past because we can influence it right why do we have more historians than futurists i, I don't expect an answer on that it is more of a rhetorical question but here is one that you can answer Point six by when do you think ai will reach human intelligence in five to ten years in 10 to 20 in 30 to 50 in 60 to 80 longer never let's see if you are an optimist a pessimist or a super pessimist Right, so here are the results. Most people, well, the, the, the answer that got the majority is 10 to 20 years. Yeah, I think that makes sense. Uh, and there are a few of you who say never, 21%. And longer than 80 years, uh, another 10%. Very interesting. Thank you very much for participating in this. That's very, very interesting. Okay, now humans. Um, some people are concerned about losing their job because of AI. Some others worry about the extinction, extinction of the human uh, species by a super AI. No one really knows what, what will end up happening. I, I personally prefer to see AI as the way for humans to be spending more time on the beach. Uh, 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 as a matter of fact, there are some pundits already talking about the 15 hour week as opposed to the 37 hour week or the 40 hour week. I think the book uh, Life 3.0, which I recommend, provides a good selection of scenarios and what might be the route that will take us there. Max Techmark is a professor of physics at MIT and president of the Future of Life Institute. He is a very, very credible person to talk about this subject. If a machine can think, it might think more intelligently than we do. And then where should we be? Even if we could keep the machines in a subservient position, we should, as a species, feel greatly humbled. That's what Alan Turing said in 1951. He is the father of, he's considered to be the father of AI. So I believe, and Max Techmark believes, that there are three logical steps that might happen. The first one is, we will build human level artificial general intelligence. Then we will use this AGI to create a, a super intelligence. And step three, we will use or unleash this super intelligence to take over the world. Humans will become as irrelevant as cockroaches, said somebody. I'm not saying that, uh, Marshall Brain. Uh, it's just an opinion, I, I, I disagree, but I think it's good to know what people think. And so here are the questions 
that uh, I think all of us should answer. Seven questions, and, and, and you can go also online and, and, and share your views and become part of the conversation of what do we want the AI to be in the next uh, years. Do you want there to be a super intelligence? First question. Second question, do you want humans to still exist, be replaced, uploaded, simulated? Do you want humans or machines in control? Do you want AIs to be conscious or not? Do you want to maximize positive experiences, minimize suffering, or leave this to sort itself out like it does now? Do you want life spreading into the cosmos? Do you want a civilization striving towards a greater purpose that you sympathize with? Or are you, are you okay with a future that forms, uh, that life forms, with life forms that appear content with uh, some goals that are point, pointlessly banal? So like I said, we all need to be part of the conversation. There's still time to figure out if we will get a, a Terminator or a, 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 a Star Wars scenario. The, um, this is just a, a recent example on how some visionary humans like Elon Musk take the bull by the horn and make bold statements, which probably they cannot fulfill but these statements achieve one very important goal. They inspire and they move notions like a brain connected directly to the internet, which is what this technology will be doing, from science fiction to the realm of possibilities. So Neuralink was working, that's the company's name, was working in stealth mode for a few years. And on August 28th, so a couple of weeks ago, they revealed what they have been doing. A battery powered chip, like the one you see here, planted in the skull, connected to the brain to cure Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, paralysis as a first step, and then become a superhuman with access to all humanity's knowledge in any language. Back to the capability we have uh, seen uh, in annotating text in any language for topics, sentiments, and so on. Lastly, let's talk a bit more about our businesses, which is probably the main reason why you registered for this event. The original title, oh, I keep coming back to the title, of this presentation was AI and Unstructured Data are changing the fundamentals of business decision making. Since, let's think together about this. Since successful organizations are data driven, according to the McKinsey report, which is, you know, it's a very solid uh, piece of research, the more data your business can ingest and understand, the higher the probability is for you to be successful, right? Unstructured data is 90% of all the data ever produced by humanity. If your company only deals with structured data, which is what you told me is the case, most of you, by answering those polls, then need I say more? You're just accessing 10% of what you could be accessing. What about the other 90%? There is no sector that has not already been affected by all these uh, technological developments, unstructured data and AI. Take the IET sectors, um, for example. Most of them are, are showing on those tiles here. Uh, check out all the sec techs shown at the bottom of the slide. If yours is not showing here, and by the way, I think all of them are self-explanatory. Prop tech means property tech. That's uh, real estate, the real estate sector in your built environment, probably. So if yours is not here, here's what you can do. Take your, the ver the, the, your vertical's name, 
cut it in half and add a tech at the end of it. It does exist, I assure you. And it is a real threat for you if you're not the ones spearheading it. Check also all the relatively new uh, disciplines on the left-hand side of this slide, like Internet of Things, blockchains, augmented reality, virtual reality, personalized ads, recommendation engines, e-commerce, robotics. Uh, there's so much going on and you can barely keep track, but there is a place to start, right? And I think that place is improving your business intelligence. I was asked to show you some practical examples as well. So I picked two from personal and home assistance, the, the sector highlighted in, in pink. Um, that's actually uh, uh, two robots that I use at my home. I will assume that most of you know the first one, Alexa, personal assistant, which competes with uh, Cortana, Siri, Google, etc. The second robot in my household uh, is powered by AI and we call it Viola. Take a look. She's a very smart vacuum cleaner, which not only cleans, but also recharges and empties its collections on its own. Check it out as it goes back to its home base to recharge and to uh, empty the dust that it collected. This brings us to the last poll of the day, poll number seven. Let me just uh, share it with you. This is more, more about the understanding of the organizers on which sector you are from, if any of these. There's also other at the bottom. I think we have a good a healthy split. Ah, there's a lot of people in other. All right, so here are the results. Um, good split. Thank you for that. That was the last poll. And this is my last slide. I want to leave you with an eight point summary and then we will go into Q&A. The pace of change will never be this slow again. That was the first point we made. Social media and AI have a much larger impact to the world than the Industrial Revolution of the 19th century. There is a shift, and that's the most difficult to understand and believe, actually. There's a shift from listening to our feelings to listening to algorithms. Some of your competitors already know all about this, which is the scary bit. Are you still discussing about digital transformation in your organization? If you are, then you're way, way, way behind the rest, depending on the country you're in. Is your organization on top of unstructured data and social intelligence? If not, there are ways to start. It's not, it's not that difficult. Do you understand your net sentiment score? of your brands, of your organization, and how it impacts your business? Are you in control of your corporate reputation? Thank you very much for your attention. I hope I didn't put you to sleep, that it wasn't too boring. We'll see, I guess, from the questions. Uh, I just wanna say a couple of things uh, before I pass it on to uh, Zen. Uh, if you want to receive this presentation desk or ask questions that we will not be able to handle during the next 30 minutes, please email me at this email address or, or tweet, send a tweet to this Twitter address. Uh, also, if you go on, on our website, there's a lot of downloadable content under resources from eBooks to uh, infographics, uh, to webinars and podcasts. 
over to you, Zen. Uh, and I think I will leave it on this slide. But thank you very much, Mihalis. Clearly, the uh, presentation has caused uh, quite a bit of a uh, response. Some people quite enthusiastically have come back with um, uh, question after question. So what I'll do, I'll, uh, we'll try and go in the order that they've been asked. I think most of the questions are decent. Uh, we've got to hear all the views. So I'm going to start with um, Peter. Uh, I think Peter is saying that at present, to what extent can AI distinguish between association and cause and effect, please? Well, it, it depends what is the data source. Like I said, AI, supervised machine learning, you can train it to do any, any single task you want from a data source that is unstructured, you can train it to do it, right? So if you, if you have, let's say you have one million posts in Chinese about people who uh, talk about something that happened to them and then that caused them to buy a certain item, right? Cause and effect. If you, if you find, um, let's say out of this 1 million, if you give, let's say 2000 of those posts to humans who speak Chinese and you ask them to read and understand what, what was really the cause and what was the effect and they will uh, annotate the posts like this, we can then in minutes create a model that can tell you the cause and effect in this specific context um, uh, in an automated way. I hope I'm answering the question. Yeah. Uh, next one from Doug. Doug has a couple of questions. I'll try and fit them both in. Uh, Doug is asking that there would appear to be a danger that the big data can be easily hacked, corrupted, manipulated to produce skewed outcomes. Is this a real threat? Which is, this is something that we had discussed before the presentation. I had similar concerns. Uh, and on, on, I think on a, on, a, on a similar sort of tone, he's also asking that uh, Doug is finding it terrifying that social media could become so influential when even a casual involvement with it suggests the overwhelming prevalence of conspiracy theories and misinformation <laughs> like yeah, yeah. COVID caused by 5G and you've mentioned some <laughs> people in your icebreaker. In the, yes, yes. Um, yeah, it's a good question. This question is, uh, is asked a lot and it has to do a little bit with fake news as well. Here is the answer, which I am not sure if you're going to like it. Um, if it's out there, so, and, and I, I will assume that we're talking about social intelligence now, right? Social media. So let's say there is a million posts about you have to buy this robot vacuum cleaner that I just showed you, which is fantastic. And let's say I'm the owner of this manufacturing. I'm the owner of this product. And I have put the 1 million posts out there, but they are shown to be from different people. Even if this is fake, even if I paid people to say this, other people will be actually impacted by this because they will not know if it's fake or not. Not everybody is you know, asking the question, not everybody is. So I think what is important to understand or, or worry about is not if it's fake or if it's paid or whatever, but worry about what impact might it have to my real customers or my friends or my family. And the, actually the question whether it's fake or not, it is moot in, in a sales and marketing environment. I'm sorry to say that, but that's what it is. Okay. Uh, thanks for that. So, um, uh, next one is from Ian. Ian has got quite a few questions as well. Um, do you ever foresee a time 
when you would be happier, and this is a bit morbid, having your amputation decided by an AI system rather than an expert medical team? Probably, yeah, probably. As a matter of fact, uh, the medical profession, doctors, even today, AI can perform diagnosis way better than a single doctor. A single doctor, imagine a doctor who has had 20 years of training and experience, and then compare this to a machine that has access to the knowledge of 20,000 doctors. And so you, you, you enter the symptoms into the machine, and instead of just accessing the 20 years of experience of this one doctor, it will access the knowledge and experience of 20,000 doctors. I'm just simplifying things. But I think, I think my answer to your question is, I would probably, you know, if it's in 30 years, I would probably, I would probably not have a choice. It will be AI, you know, it won't be a choice anymore. Thank you, Michael. The next one, so there's, there's a number of these about the, 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 the risks and the regulation around AI. So is there any uh, regulations uh, in the UK that put a legal framework about its application? And, I'll, I'll, and another exactly. question was around, uh, what sort of prospect and risk assessment would you recommend prior to adopting AI? So one is, what would you do to protect yourself? And is there any reg regulation to actually protect against yes. AI I, going wrong? Yeah. There is not much, and that's exactly the point. And I, I, again, I will encourage you to go to this website and make your opinion known, because we as, a, as humanity, we are still trying to figure out what are the values that we want to give to those machines? We're not sure what are the values. It's, it's, you know, even if you think of something as simple as do no harm to a human, that's not good enough. There are examples in literature that shows you that it is, it is better to do harm to a human in order to save, let's say, 7 billion humans. And that, so, so that's not an easy thing. There, there is not much. There are two aspects. There's the ethical framework and there is the legal framework. We need to work on both. Uh, if you read uh, Life 3.0, you, you will see that there is there's a, an independent initiative that started in Puerto Rico a few years ago. Luminaries went there, you know, Stephen Hawking was still alive and, uh, and Elon Musk and, uh, and the Kasabis and everybody who is involved in AI, they went there and they basically came up with these seven questions uh, that I encourage. And they are saying, please take part in the conversation because we don't know, you know, we don't know, we don't know yet. And uh, yes, there are, there are many risks and, and that is exactly what we should try and avoid the risks by all becoming part of this conversation. So uh, maybe I would just show it again, the, the URL in case you didn't see it, because I think that's, uh, yeah, that's really important. Here's the URL, okay. Ageofai.org. If you go there, you can become part of this conversation. Excellent, so you are not an advocate of making humanity redundant, you're saying there's a conversation to be had. I am, I'm certainly not an, an advocate of making humanity redundant. <laughs> I just want to spend a lot of time on the beach and be fulfilled and happy and healthy and maybe live a bit longer than 100 years. That's what I want. Excellent. And, 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 and you've already mentioned the downsides of what could go wrong if we don't uh, participate uh, in what happens when the machines are more capable on, than the humans. Exactly. The explosion of intelligence is what we are afraid of. So, so because even pulling the plug will not do the trick at that, in that case. So, so we have to be very careful in the next 10, 20, 30 years, as we're coming closer to the singularity moment or the super intelligence, we really have to have a solid legal and 
ethical framework. Th think, you know, I, I, we were talking the other day, Zen, about the, the film Ex Machina. I don't know, that's a film for people to, to watch. There is the creator of AI and then the AI, you know, becomes offended because she feels like a slave and kills the creator, right? We don't want that. And, and, and talking about movies, there's a comment in the Q&A uh, box that I'm not quite sure what it means about um, maybe uh, you haven't watched Battlestar Galactica. Now, I personally watched every single series. Uh, any, any idea what, they, uh, what that may mean? No. Uh, it's not sure. about is that. Is that, is that, is that a question? Uh, it's not a question. I just couldn't tell um, where AI and Battlestar Galactica <coughs> are linked. Apologies. So uh, we're going to go back on to uh, an interesting qu question from Martin. Uh, does the machine learning cater for sarcasm in the determination of allocation for sense? Yes. Excellent question. <coughs> the answer is yes, because uh, remember the example earlier with the, the, the training data? So, so if we, let's say we harvest uh, posts from the last 12 months about soft drinks in the UK. And we've harvested 800,000 posts about 10 brands, Coca-Cola, Sprite, Fanta, etc. Now, if we take... 10,000 posts out of this 800, and we give it to five native speakers of the English language, and we ask them to annotate these 10,000, go through them. It takes about an hour to go through 200 tweets. So it would take you know, four people a couple of days to do 10,000. They go through it, they read it. If they get the sarcasm, they will give it the right uh, sentiment, right? If they don't get the sarcasm, they won't. So whatever those annotators, whatever their judgment is, and we have to make sure if we are the ones, if I'm the data scientist, I need to check my, the, the judgment of my annotators to make sure it is sound. There will always be disagreements because there are ambiguous posts out there that is definitely not clear if it's positive or negative, even if you understand sarcasm. But where sarcasm is obvious, I want my annotators to uh, understand it. And if they do, then the algorithm will know how to do the exact same thing because the training data becomes like the brain of the algorithm. And so when, when new posts about soft drinks come in the next day and the day after and the day after, the algorithm will look at the post, go back to the 10,000 annotated, find patterns that fit that one and say it's positive or negative or neutral okay so i i, I think you you've answered that there's a num there's a number of questions about uh machine consciousness the difference between intelligence wisdom and consciousness and where does emotional intelligence figure in how algorithms are built any, yeah. any, can you elaborate on that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Consciousness is a big thing. It's a big question. Uh, we can't even define it very well. We are trying. That's one of the. That's part of the conversation that that will take place. It's um, the uh, what, what is the definition of consciousness, and will we ever be able to transfer it? to a pure machine because don't forget the future might not be the super intelligence might not end up being just a machine it might be a combination of a human and the machine like elon's uh, vision elon musk and stephen hawking's and bill gates they warn humanity about the the danger of a star wars scenario so obviously he's trying to steer us in a different direction of a super intelligence, but we will see, we will see. And it may, plus it may never happen, right? It may never happen that there is uh, human intelligence, uh, uh, AI or, or um, 
sorry, my light is playing here. Uh, or, or um, you know, uh, consciousness. So. Okay. Uh, thanks for that. Uh, there's a comment by Jason here regarding artificial general intelligence. Uh, I think it says Andrew NG uh, from Stanford believes that we are very far away. Reasoning is that most advances in AI recently have been in narrow AI or ANI. Do you have a different view? No, I, like I said, um... We are doing narrow AI right now. Um, the optimists think we will have general uh, AI uh, in 10 to 20 years. The pessimists by the end of the century, some people say even longer and some people say never. What, what my personal opinion is, is that I, I think we will get there. Um, I will probably say in this century. That would be my, my guess, but it's just a guess. Thanks for that. Uh, a question on uh, some of my favorite uh, apps that keep interfering when I'm watching um, movies. Uh, do you believe that Alexa, Siri, listen to conversations in order to influence, influence the adverts that you might see later or search engines and social media. So do you think we've yeah. been spied on at home? Yeah. I've heard stories from friends, you know, uh, that, you know, uh, we were discussing this in the, in the sitting room. And then the next day I received this email and I am sure she's listening. Look, it's, it's illegal to do it without telling you. So check your, check the permissions that you give Alexa. And uh, listening in without permission is uh, and and evaluating your data is is not is not legal. I'm 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 not I'm not going to say I know they are not doing it because I don't for sure, but I know that that it's not legal. And you know if you know the same way, Zuckerman uh, puts a tape in front of his webcam because it's the safest way to avoid hacking the, the, the webcam. I think if, if, you, if you are in, in that school of paranoia, then I would say unplug Alexa. And everything else. <laughs> everything else. And, 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 and all the cameras that have yeah. gone all, all over the place. Um, a question on uh, a point and a question about uh, unstructured data coming from a minority of the population living on Twitter and Instagram who could drown out the thoughtful, experienced and competent. So it's, it's, it's an interesting point. Uh, it is, but like I said before, what we care about is not who posts and whether it's true or not. What we care about is how many read those posts and how are they impacted? That's all that matters, really. So we, we just need to look at who is expressing which opinions and who is reading these opinions and who is impacted and how is their behavior impacted? Like we saw the, the stocks, remember? Uh, negative comments about Deutsche Bank which was, it was, to be more specific, it was Trump suing Deutsche Bank in the United States. Negative went up, stock price went down, right? So if, if this is true or not, it doesn't matter. People read it, they believed it, they reacted. Yeah, that, that answers a number of questions we've had about, you know, how do you know what customers want who are not on social media uh, and, and I believe you answered that. Um, Ramesh, do you want to pick up any of your favorite questions uh, from the people who joined uh, a bit late? Just I want to make sure that we cover. Yeah, no, I think, um, I think the most interesting ones are the film-based ones because it just gives an element of reality. So another one that's coming is, 
what do you think is a Star Wars based scenario? Just just to bring it to life a little more. Yeah, I, I think it's one whereby the AI fights humanity for dominance. That's uh, that's how I see it. Uh, maybe I'm. Yeah, I, I don't know the series very well, but the Star Wars scenario. When I refer to it, I mean the machines against humanity to take over the world. Yeah, and, 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 and go ahead. Sorry. No, and, and when that ties into the singularity moment that you mentioned, how much work do you think the different industries will need to do to move towards um, getting the right levels of legalities and the frameworks in place? Um, yeah, I, 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 th I, think, I think this is a matter for voters and it will define elections going forward. I don't think it's a, it's a question just for businesses or scientists. I think it's a question for all of us, for all humanity. What do we want? Where, because we may say we definitely don't want a machine to be a super intelligence. If we say that, I'm not, I'm not saying we would be able to avoid it, but maybe delay it or, or yeah. So, so first we need to decide what we want yeah. because, and it's about time to do so. Narrow AI, there's nothing to be afraid of from narrow AI, right? Got it. Okay, great, thank you. Um, yeah, Zen? Uh, on, a couple of questions regarding um, your thoughts on AI-driven hacking of personal data versus AI-driven network security. Okay, we, we actually worked, and, and I know Rimesh is in the security sector, so he may have a view, uh, but I will give you an answer, and then let's see if he has uh, something. So we worked on a, on a project whereby we developed uh, an AI that takes posts, not only from the sources I showed you, but also from the dark net, where a lot of the hackers are, are live, uh, in Chinese, in Russian, and in English, and we trained algorithms in these three languages to annotate th threats and score them. And for which operating system or which device is the threat. Because sometimes people boast, sometimes somebody discovers it first before anyone else. And it's, it's an early warning system. So you can very well apply AI to catch those, to avoid those, to defend yourself. Uh, and, and add it to a CM, which is a, 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 a product, a service, a tool that companies have to protect themselves. The, the flip side of the coin, which is to create AI to, I think if I understood it correctly, to, to go after hacking personal data. I, I don't know about that, to be honest. I, 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 I'm not, not sure. Rimesh, you may know more than me. Yeah, no, I think, I think that's, that's exactly it. It's all about setting the precedent on knowing what we want to um, safeguard. So once you've got your data categories, like you're saying, you use the AI to understand the different vectors um, and the different types of anomalies that can exist and how you tie back into your own industry regu regulatory framework, whether you're in the medical field, insurance field, on how your actual application for AI exists. That's, that's the story we all collectively need to um, work towards. Yeah, so it's just about matching those anomalies. Uh, thanks for that, uh, Rimesh. I'll, I'll go through, we've got time for a few more questions. Um, one relating to uh, COVID, do you think it's accelerated or slowed AI, AI adoption? And uh, some reference to the A-level algorithm disaster ramifications on public confidence. I don't know. I don't know if it accelerated or, or stopped generally in my company because we decided to be you know, to pr it was an opportunity to press the reset button in, in April. It gave us an opportunity to look more inwards and say, uh, what, what do we do well? What should we do more of? What should we do less of? In our case, we made huge strides from April to now 
in new what I was saying, new AI. So, for example, for the first time, we are uh, experimenting with the same model to annotate for sentiment, for topics, for noise, and for emotions. Uh, whereas in the past, we were doing one model for each uh, for each task. Now it's one model is multitasking. So in, in our case, it, it, it helped us, but I, I, I don't know if this is the case for most of the companies. Okay, thank you. Um, an interesting question here about a couple of questions regarding uh, the ethics of AI in the absence of regulation, uh, how, how how do we uh, make sure that uh, what's what's acceptable uh, in terms of ethics and morality, uh, and and we don't go beyond the boundaries? Yeah, I, I think common sense, if there is such a thing, should govern our decisions. I think GDPR applies uh, and, and it doesn't matter if you're using AI or if you're a human. So many, many of the ethical frameworks that we have, thankfully, apply to narrow AI. They may not apply to a super intelligence because we don't know what a super intelligence is capable of, but we do know what narrow AI is capable of and I'm not allowed to listen in to your conversations without you giving me permission if I'm Alexa. I, we know that, right? So there's no doubt about that. Uh, I'm not allowed to uh, steal your data. I'm not allowed to uh, you know, follow you around and, uh, and uh, be a big brother. All the, all the things that apply to a non-AI situation apply for now. This might change. That's why we need to become part of this conversation. And uh, another one, how do you manage unconscious bias in the human training of AI? Excellent point. Um, we, we did a lot of R&D on this and uh, there's a thing called inter-annotator agreement. So if you have five people uh, who have some biases and you're asking them to judge if something they read is positive or negative or is it good or bad or does it have a cause or whatever. In order to avoid that bias, we give to all of them 10% of what they annotate is the same. And then we compare their results. That's what we call inter-annotator agreement. And if somebody's an outlier, we might exclude them. We're trying to find patterns between the five or six or 10 annotators that we are using for a certain job and, and, and try to el eliminate, uh, well, unconscious uh, bi biases are difficult to discover, but maybe, maybe it's easy to see the annotation and find the, uh, the outliers without knowing what really the, the bias was. So there's some sort of protection there, but you're right. It, 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 each person has a different judgment, different common sense. Unfortunately, there is not such a thing as common sense. And, and, and you know, a related one about should we teach AI systems to have moral responsibility, which implies blame, praise, guilt, remorse, pride, well, that, that implies that they have feelings, right? I assume he's talking about, or she is talking about the AI re having a remorse and so on. That's yeah. the conversation that we need to have. What are the values? And will there be consciousness? And, and, and some examples about um, AI use in cryptocurrency exchange, do you think it will play a big role in future digital Currency markets? I'm afraid I'm not an expert at that. I, I know they use blockchains, obviously, but uh, I, I don't know. Uh, it seems like Ramesh is shaking his head. Maybe he knows something. 
Um, no, I think it's um, it's the whole digital currency is that whole landscape is a new one. Um, I know Bitcoin is obviously trading a lot, and it's a key in indicator um, in a form of index on which way the markets are going. But but specifically, will it it you know when you use AI with blockchain or blockchain currencies, digital currencies, it's just an indicator, um, just like transaction of gold, silver, and all the other precious metals are. It's it's yeah. just understanding how you want to use AI, um, and based on that, how you want to measure um, your stocks. So. One one application that I just thought of maybe is to maybe AI could improve the efficiency of producing. Uh, a Bitcoin using a processor or, or, you know, a GPU or multiple GPUs or whatever. Maybe, maybe there is an optimization whereby AI is already used. Actually, maybe, maybe that's the case. I don't know though, for sure. I've just seen one more question uh, about, um, and this is quite a general one, I guess. Um, just your general thoughts. To, um, it says. What's your take on using AI within military systems? Should they, should they be made to a certain specification where they act as an anti-deterrent by default? What's the general thought? Yeah, yeah. I, th I think everybody is trying to avoid an arms race in the AIs, in the AI sector, the same way we had the space race, the, you know, the whatever, mm. all these things that are happening. Uh, for example, Google refuses DeepMind, as Demis Hassabi said at the IET event, they refuse to work with the military. And I think rightly so. And I, I hope it will not become another tool for, you know, to harm people. So we had an, 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 some questions about, in your view, any examples of companies that are using AI quite successfully or are perceived to be using it successfully. And a related one about uh, what's the attitude towards AI in different countries? In the, do they I mean, welcome it, the sphere towards it? Is there, is there a different approach by different cultures to AI? Yeah. Um, I think the, the companies that I will that are top of mind for me in uh, usage of AI are, of course, Amazon, uh, Google, the, the big tech companies, right? Microsoft, Facebook, uh, all these, Apple, all of these uh, big companies are, are involved. Uh, the um, the self-driving cars, look at all these companies, right? Uh, and many of the four or five that I mentioned are in this business as well. So they are, they are big users of AI. Um, I think in developed markets, you will be, it will be very difficult to find companies um, that are not doing something in AI. In, in markets where internet penetration is low, I think, I think there's a correlation between connectivity, internet penetration, and use of high tech. So I would say, um, um, and I, I don't think it's about culture. I think it's about access to technology, access to funds, entrepreneurial spirit, and entrepreneurial infrastructures, and then spirit. Thanks, Michalis. I, I'm afraid we're not gonna be able to cover all the questions. I, I've learned so much tonight. Just been reading a question from Shaw Shiraki about uh, click farms. I didn't realize there was such a thing as a click farm. And you can imagine yeah. what the question is. I think you answered a related question about uh, how, how is the, the, the data from social media uh, being manipulated and what uh, yeah. you can do about it. I don't know yeah. if you have anything further to add. Yeah, I, I just, look, it is our responsibility to identify it and and remove it, but like I said, uh, I mean, I, I was reading today in the press uh, or yesterday that Amazon removed 20,000 reviews because they were paid reviews, for example. Good for them, good that they covered them, good that they re removed them. Uh, this click uh, baits, uh, this, uh, this is a 
big cancer in the, in the marketing and advertising business. Uh, it's, it's really bad, but it's happening. Uh, and uh, I think the industry bodies are trying to find ways to, to eliminate it, but not very successfully so far. Fascinating. I, I, I will keep an eye on uh, developments now. It attracted my interest, Michalis. Uh, Rimesh, is there anything else that you think um, uh, we haven't covered? I see quite a lot of repetition and similar yeah. uh, questions. There's only one. Maybe it goes back to the slide where you've mentioned all the different types of industries where you can just split it up and add the word tech. There's one question about education and technology from an anonymous person. What, what role do you think um, AI played in the recent educational results? What's your take on, on that? Yeah, I, I'm sure there is edu, edu tech. I've heard, yeah. I've heard of it before. Um, I can't think of the top of my head. Uh, I, I, I think uh, of an example, but I can imagine that a deep learning model can uh, uh, learn from the answers of a student, uh, their level, and then give them back a personalized uh, plan Develop. to, yeah, Develop. for example. Yeah, yeah. That, that's, a, that's an easy thing to, to do. I, I, I use this kind of thing for my uh, athletic training. You know, I, I, I use an AI to tell me what I should do next. Yeah. Great. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. Then. Excellent. Thank you, Michalis. I mean, this is where I, I normally wrap up and uh, offer a word of thanks. But what we'll do, and I did say we're not going to monitor uh, the, the chat box, but there's a nice message here from Yong Cha Wang, uh, who I suppose it's visible to everybody, but I'm just going to read it out because you may have missed it. It says, many thanks to the speaker, host, and coordinators. It's informative, philosophical, and insightful. Good visualization, topics like text mining, topic modeling, social network analysis, alternative data-driven decision-making, EEG, NERSI. I think that may be, if I'm missing it, um, don't understand that. Uh, are interesting and the AI formula addresses the three main drivers of AI, data, algorithm and computing power. And good to see how sentiment analysis can help improve supply chain, one of many good use cases applied in business intelligence. So uh, somebody has done my job for me, so I thank them and I thank you for taking the time to be with us today. Unfortunately, had we been back to Savoy Place, we'd be heading up. Uh, and because it's summer still, we would probably be at the rooftop having a glass of wine and some nibbles uh, and have some informal conversation. I think we're going to have to save that when we can go back uh, safely. Uh, so uh, I don't know if there's a way I can unmute everybody here to. Uh, Thank you in the traditional way. We still have got 125 attendees with us. Um, I'll leave it. I'm sure they're, um, they're doing that at home. So uh, thank you very much. Thank you. I appreciate that. Sir. Thanks. So I do have just, just an announcement about our event next month. It will be online and will be here online for, as I suspect, another six months. It's an event that we are co-hosting every year with the Royal Television Society. Really interesting. So about the uh, technological development in the world of broadcasting and streaming media and technologies behind it. So it, it's, it's called the IBC, International Broadcasting Corporations Accelerator Program. And it's on the 14th of October at 6.30. So if you got an invite for this event, uh, you'll get an invite for that event as well uh, so that you can register. And um, the next slide, uh, we've got our social media, the IT London Networks, uh social media accounts for anybody who wishes to uh, continue the debate online uh, you can find us on uh, under the hashtag it central london network
and uh, time has come to actually say good night to everybody. We did have a very good participation. Uh, I think I've noticed at some stage uh, a stable number of about up to about 260. So um, that's a, quite a good uh, attendance for an online event. So uh, thank you very much again. All right, and good night, everybody, and uh, stay safe. Bye. Thanks. Right. Bye-bye, all.